another snow day. But praise the Lord, we, we all made it out. So let's just stand this morning. Any prayer request uh, as we go to the Lord? Let's remember Brother Boyd and his family at uh, this time. Uh, we have had more news than what we got this week, but uh, they need a prayer. And uh, there may be unspoken requests this morning. All right, let's all lift up our voice to the Lord. Heavenly Fathers, we come before Thee. We thank You, Lord, that we can come before Thee. And it's because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lord, that we can approach Thee. Lord, You've seen the service. You've seen this moment, Lord. Lord, You know even every thought, Lord. And I know, Lord, You can answer every prayer. And Lord, we have come here to worship and praise Thee this morning. Lord, I just ask, bless those that couldn't be here as well. And Thy nation, Israel even this hour that we live in. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. We're going to have Brother Paul come lead us in the song service. see everybody out this morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Reach out and touch the Lord as He goes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear
Thank you, Lord. is 
Thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. If there's a will, there's a way. He makes a way. Praise the Lord. Anybody have a song in your heart this morning? Come on right up, Gary. Thank you, Lord.
be removed the tooth without one single complication. <coughs> they have no pain. Man. The only thing I had a little bit of swelling. But I was thinking about that scripture, giving thanks. And for me, was, why is it so hard for us to give thanks? We have to wait until God does a miracle. God does something big that we have to give him thanks. You know, even in the natural, when you go to give a hand to, for somebody to help somebody, you don't do it because you want to, you know, be lifted up. That's not the reason why you would do it. But when somebody acknowledges that they'll say to you, thank you very much for giving me a, a helping hand. How much more, our Heavenly Father, that we would just acknowledge and give Him thanks, even in the, the small things, just to be able to get up in the morning, be able to yes. walk, yes. be able to use your hand, be able to see. All these things that we take for granted. But the Lord, is, He's so good and He's so, he's so merciful. I, mean, I am so thankful this morning, most of all, that He saved a wretch like me. Praise Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> uh, Sister Leona, after Gary, do you have a song? Yeah, good. No pressure. That's okay. Uh, uh, I'm going to try this number because down deep in my heart I am so glad. So glad that God has set me free. There is a song in my heart today Something I never had Jesus has taken my sin away Oh, say, but I'm glad Oh, say, but I'm glad I'm glad Oh, say, but I'm glad Wonderful, marvelous loves he brings into a heart that's sad. Through darkest tunnels a soul just sings, oh, say but I'm glad. fellowship rich and sweet tongues can never relate abiding in him is a real tree oh say but I'm glad oh say but I'm glad I'm glad
cross has taken my sins away. soldier in God's mighty army since many long years ago and I've been scarred
Um, Brother Elijah, do you have a song? If the Lord ever puts a song on your heart and uh, you feel like you should come up and sing it, you should probably come up and sing it. I'm just putting it out there. It doesn't matter who you are, just you should come up and sing it. So, just letting you know. He's an on time God. Oh yes, he is. Oh yes, he is. He's an on time God. Yes, he is. Oh yes, he is. Oh, he may not come when you want him, but you be there while you're on time. He's an on time God. Yes, he is. Oh yes, he is. They were the children of Israel. They were trapped at the Red Sea. Oh, but I mean no farewell and his army. There were water all among them and Pharaoh on their tracks. Found out of nowhere, God step and he made a highway just like that. On time gone. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, he's an on time gone. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, he may not come when you want him, but you be there while you're on time. He's an on time gone. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. You can ask the five thousand, oh, hungry souls defend, oh, by the banks of the river, where two fish and five rolls of bread, oh, what a miracle, he performed for the multitude, oh, what he did, way back then, you will do the same for you and and on time gone. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, he's an on time gone. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, he may not come when you want him, but you be there while you're on time. Oh, he's an on time gone. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. You can ask the five thousand, oh, hungry souls defend, oh, by the banks of the river, with two fish and five rolls of bread, oh, what a miracle, he performed for the multitude, oh, what he did, way back then, he'll do the same for you and
have a little life to take care of, and um, and I'm older, and uh, <laughs> um, uh, and through it, I've uh, in my weakness, I was frustrated and discouraged. Um, and the doctors were, you know, he's like, I can admit you to the hospital. I'm like, no, <laughs> I can't do that. Um, but he put me on medication, of course, and that didn't work. And um, there's this other medication that he wanted to try me on. And um, it's, there's always risks to medications, I guess. But um, this one was, you know, the same as other ones. And... He, I thought I wouldn't be able to try it or start it for two full weeks, and by then I'd been sick for two full months. And uh, I thought, two more weeks, I don't know if I can do this. And um, somehow um, he managed to get me in within a couple of days, so I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Um, and I know, like, of course, through it all, I was asking the Lord to heal me. <laughs> because um, that's, I think, everything that every, everybody wants. Um, and I've been healed before, and, and the Lord knows um, my desires. But uh, I guess this is the journey I need to go on for now, and I know that when the age of the miraculous comes and uh, we're going to be healed, he, we need some sick people to heal. So, um, but through it all, my family and friends had been so supportive, um, I can't even say enough about that. Um, I couldn't even look after Louisa on my own. Um, and it's, it's funny how I testified in mid-November about how good the Lord was throughout my pregnancy and all the obstacles that uh, the Lord helped us overcome to have this precious little child. And not two weeks later, Satan struck me with this... Um, flare-up, I guess, of my ulcerative colitis, and I knew that, um, that it was Satan, because the Lord had been so good through everything, um, but uh, yeah, my, I, I had to go to mom's uh, to help me look after Louisa, and nobody wants to have to ask for help, I have a hard time, um, but the help was so amazing, and people offering to help, and I'm just thankful for that, um, almost 100%. Um, so I'm so thankful for that, and I'm just enjoying motherhood again. <laughs> you don't know how discouraging it is not to be able to look after your child on your own um, just because of something Satan decides he wants to throw at you. But um, I'm stronger now through it, and I, I think I've learned that you really need to pray before the storm. Um, I know I was lacking in that area before, and um, I really need to work on that, but I... I really need uh, the Lord to help me with that, but I'm thankful that I'm here today and I'm able to play. And the Lord is is good and faithful, and I know He's going to continue to be that way. And I'm just so thankful to Him today. Yeah. 
Sister Brenda, do you have a song this morning? Anyway, this morning, something happened, and that song came back to me again. And I believe that the Lord will give you scriptures or songs to help you through that time. Because sometimes we really do just like feel like we're running away. But he wants us to run to him. And I'm so thrilled to have Jana back. It just thrills my soul. And I'm thankful for that. I'll just sing the whole thing first. Thank you.
And I was like, man, if we could just hold on to that thought and we yeah. deal with things in life and to realize that God's there. And of course, He wants us to glow and stuff like that, but He will never say, stop coming to me for help. And I realize that more than ever. She can ask me for help till I'm you know, 80 years old, and I'll do as much as I can to help her. And I know God's the same way. And you know, I hear everything this morning, that song, you know, run to Jesus. And just, <laughs> it doesn't matter how small or how big our problems are. If we can just have that mindset, go to Him first. You know, don't wait till your knee, your, your, your neck deep in trouble. You know, if, maybe that's your ankles or your knees. <laughs> Uh, so I'm really grateful. He's always teaching me stuff and really making me realize just how much he's, he's God, but he's also our father. And, you know, we're a big family. He's going to be there for us. So I'm really grateful. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the Lord also. It's uh, not a testimony for me, but it's my sister again. Um, a couple of weeks ago, she was at work again, and... Uh, there was something come up, and she was really discouraged about it, and uh, she just let it go, and she went about her day, just met the on the Lord, and uh, at work, and uh, this man walked in the store, and she never seen before, and he had a, a little loose leaf of paper, and he had all folded up, and he just handed it to her, and he walked out the store, and she uh, found her it's about when she opened it up, it, it said, uh, Jesus loves you. So the Lord sent that man to give her that little piece of paper. And just with all these things, the Lord is going to her on and he hasn't her and whatnot. And I just want to thank you for that. I love him. Praise the Lord. Glad to see the Lord, that Jesus is still on the throne, that he's not done with us yet, so praise the Lord, and uh, enjoyed the testimonies this morning, and the presence of God in the song service and so forth, and truly the Lord is, is wonderful. Let's bow our head, Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of the service, Lord. As we would look into your word, I just pray, Lord, have your way this morning. And Lord, we're ever so thankful for, Lord, what you've brought to us in our bosom in this day and this hour. And Lord, we're thanking you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Still on the same subject. About our Heavenly Father. That He's a spirit. That He fills the universe. 
the subject can be long and wide and however we get into when we speak about the creator of all things. And we, how we had talked in week past how that we talked about the relationship between God and man. How that when Adam was created, when you and I were created, he gave us the spirit of life. When Jesus was created, he gave him the spirit of life as well. But I'm thankful for the new birth. Now, Jesus had it without measure. But I'm thankful for that, too. Because we needed a Savior, and the Lord knew that before the foundation of the world. But the same Spirit, led the Spirit of life that's in Jesus, or whether it is in us, God's Spirit came, and that's how the two Spirit comes together, and we are born again. Jesus is the first creation. He's not... He's the first one of the new creation, although he's the second Adam from the natural creation. And so this morning I thought, looking at to maybe some other aspect this morning, yes, God created all things. How many can start to see that? It's only been that Because of the time that arrives, that man can have a certain knowledge of things, that the Word of God can look into a deeper meaning of how God created the heavens and the earth. And I remember when I was a Catholic church, they didn't teach much on that. God took made a little star over here and a little planet over there and and then he made the sun and the moon and all all those things. But that's a childish and it's good for a child that God, yes, he's the creator of things. But of what we've man has learnt in the last ten, fifteen years, and the evidence is there staring us in the face that when the Big Bang was created, our sun did not exist there. The earth didn't exist there. Only after almost 10 billion years later, or 8 billion years later, did the stars of our universe now start to exist and the planet Earth. Well, what happened in that long length of time? God's not in a hurry. But what he done, he didn't go in his chemistry set or, or start moving things around. He spoke laws that they behave by. And some of these laws was gravity. Now that's a big word for some of you. That thermodynamic, it means heat. Fusion, nuclear. Motion, relativity, mathematics, how things behave. And magnetic. So from the, when the Big Bang started, he instituted those laws in which m normal matter would behave by. Now, I don't want to get into the whole history because there's things that, that you can f listen for a couple hours just to find out how the pr whole process went through. But I just want to relate this morning. God set his ordinances. Uh, maybe at the, I might have it here somewhere. So. And when he talks about how that God made the ordinances, his ordinances are laws. And sometimes we think of laws, well, yeah, we got the, uh, the law of the country, we got the law of the Ten Commandments, but these are laws of nature, how nature behaves. And so uh, as God has, was the originator of those laws, how they behave, then man has no way of digging in to find out what makes that law work. It's the power of God. I mean, gravity. 
They studied that even to the hour we live. They know it exists. They can measure what it, its effect. But they don't know how it really works. And we don't need to know all the scientific and the quantum physics to under, try to analyze some of the, how the measurements are. Hey, if I jump down there, gravity's going to let me fall, let my feet fall down on the low, lower level. I can throw something in the air, and it's going to come down. Now, God is the creator of those things. Now, in God is the creator of those things, but He's also, if you want to, He knows the times and the seasons in which things behave. And when we talk about times and seasons, we can go to Genesis. Yes, we look back to the knowledge what man can read in, in the scripture. But if we place ourselves in the days of Adam, he's on the earth. He had no watch. He had no telescope. And did Adam know about the times or why God put a moon, why the stars are in place? Well, in Genesis 1 and 14 it says, God said, let there be lights in the firmament in the heavens to divide the day. And it's the word so simple, to divide the day. Because of our modern thinking, we day, oh, well, that's 24 hours. But Adam had no watch. There was no such thing as measuring time as so many hours and so many minutes. He was placed on the earth. Yes, he saw how God in the creative days, why and why God, like Genesis 1 14, he knew what God had put into his word because he was there in heaven knowing these things for a thousand years. He was created on the sixth day and now God puts him on the earth in the eighth day or the first day of, of our 6,000 years. So he knew of seeing things that God had placed in there. They were there for times and seasons. But in the day that Adam was there, the only way you could tell time and some of these people that are trackers or people that, that hunt, well, not so much hunters, but today they use GPS and all that kind of new gadgets. But did you know you could use a simple thing called a stick? You put a stick in the ground. Now present this is a stick. When the sun shines on it, okay, it's going to go a half arc from morning the evening, right? So all he needed to know approximately what time it, what time's dinner's at. Now I'm, I know I'm pleasanting there. And so he would know he would be at the, at the middle of it. It also tells you from east from west. The sun always rises in the east, goes to bed in the west. So it is a, a crude compass, if you want to. And so in the days of Adam, he knew what the word day meant. It's a cycle. The moon, he knew it in the, in the days of Adam before the flood. It was 30 days, 30 cycles that the moon would be back in its, its season. Adam was there when God spoke about the, the stars. Now, God, it's God that named the stars. And Adam... He didn't, God, God didn't say, Adam, now you go hide yourself. I'm going to name these stars. Adam knew who they were. And by the stars, God didn't want them to use the stars as astrology to, to look at prophetic things that were going to take place. But they, they were meant to be there for years or a year, a period of time. Because if you, when you, we go around the sun then those stars become back again in its original place. Now, Adam didn't have to know, well, well, he's going to be here in 12 hours and 10 minutes. No, somewhere's around that season. So 
he, uh, he knew a bit about time. So and in, in, in his times, now the times, in the, and when it talks about four seasons, when it talks about times, time is a, just a multiplier of something. If I put it in here somewhere. Oh well. In as man moved from the there from the time of the flood, then man got more sophisticated instead of using a stick, he started using a, a sundial. How many know what that is? And then he put some numbers around to set a little bit more precise. But yet, man coming out of the garden, as far as centuries concerned, there was nothing for them to be concerned about. But God knew when he talks about times and seasons, he's talking about centuries and decades. And so therefore, as time goes on, when centuries, if you want to, uh, okay, if you want a scripture concerning those, the stars and concerning the ordinances of heaven, it's in Job chapter 38, verse 32 and verse 33. God is speaking to Job. He says, can thou bring out the Mazarus, the which is the twelfth sign of Zodiac, in his seasons? Do you know how to do that, Job? Well, of course, Joe couldn't do that. He would, he just had to observe the stars. And verse 33 says, know, Knowest thou the ordinances of, of heaven? Well, the thing you see on the screen now, these are the ordinances of the heavens. And so now as man gets to the place where time moves on from Adam's day, from the flood, then history started to be recorded of things that was of days gone by. And it is God that uses the terms times. The word century did not, was not even compute, wouldn't even compute in the days of Adam, nor in the days of Noah. But only when you come to Moses, when he started writing about the Genesis, there were times, and then it talks about God in days, of, in times of old, how he created the earth, how he done this, and so forth. Those were centuries, not days and years. They were centuries of time that would go through. We have a scripture in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21 speaks about how God, he says, he changes the times. He doesn't change the clock or the watches or the sun. But what's it really referring to? He changes the signs and the seasons. Now here's a clue. He removed kings and he sets up kings. And he gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge unto them that know understanding. So God changes the time. What does, he, what does that really mean saying? I'll put it in simple terms. He, when the Babylonian Empire came to an end, he changed his times. Now became the media Persian Empire. Because an empire that is going to live and exist is God's power and strength that makes it, if you want to, be on the history line while it is going. But when God it wants to change to something else, he removes the conditions and that empire will fall away. Then he moves into another one. All right? So it is God, when he speaks about times, if we can read it in the scripture, He's not talking about 24 hours or in a terms of years. Empires don't live in days or a, a number of years. They, they live in centuries. So I'm just trying to bring a definition of the word times this morning.
In Job chapter 24, verse 1, it says, Times are not hidden from God. Why? Because He knows the, the end before the beginning. He knows the beginning before the end. Uh, he knows everything from the beginning. Psalms 44 and 1. God works in the times of old. So he just didn't work in our day or in the days of Moses and so forth. And he prophesies of times afar off. Now when we prophesy about this, well, the prophecy about the 70 weeks of Daniel, that's more than 100 years. But they didn't have the word in their vocabulary in those olden days what centuries was. Centuries only became known when man started making the modern calendar. All right? And where are you going with this? Well, you're going to see in a minute. Uh, I'm going to bring in also talking about times. In Luke 21, 24, the scripture talks about the times of the Gentiles. That's not 24 hours. That's not a few years. Those are centuries. When the scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 to 2, but of the time and the seasons, brethren, you ought to know that the Lord is not going to come as a thief in the night. So is it for the bride at the end time to know the times and the seasons. Yes, it is, because if you don't know, then God will come as a thief in the night. Oh, but we have Brother Branham. Oh, we have the Pentecostal. We have the Bible. We, we, we have all these things, but they don't know the time or the seasons. That's why Jesus talked about even when he's talking to the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 16, and verse 3, in that area, it says, In the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Now, what did Jesus say to them? Here, these ones are educated. They should be knowing the times and seasons, because the 70 weeks of Daniel, they should have known it, and among other things. But then he goes on to say, O oh, ye hypocrites! Would Jesus be called, considering them as believers? They were educated in the word of God of the past. But they couldn't see their day. And so Jesus says to them, You can discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the sign of the times. And if we can't discern the signs of the time and the hours you and I live in, then the Lord, I don't care how one may claim he's revelated and understanding has so many scriptures, if you don't know the times in what God calls the times, then that day is going to come to unto you unaware, even though you might be intellectually revelated. Because we're coming for a day that there's going to be a rapture. A seven seal is going to be broke. So is it important? Why did Jesus say, you have to watch? You don't equate that watching for your soul. He was infer inferring, watching for my coming. That you would know the time and the season so you won't be caught unaware. Because at, when that time and the season arrive, he will have brought on ground revelation that they should be walking in to know the time they're living in. And now brings me to the scripture that I want to deal with this morning. And I've dealt with it in the past, but I'm going to want to look at other things this morning as well. In Acts chapter 1 verse 7. Here's Jesus. He's talking to his disciples. He's, he's resurrected. And he says, and he's speaking to them. Now he's not being mean, but he's being, he wants to tell them something, that there's something ahead. But it, it put it reading between the lines, it would be no good for me to tell you all the things that pertain to it. So he says, and he said to them, 
It is not for you to know the time and the seasons. That's the centuries and the decades. And the understanding of centuries and de decades, it's, it's through the ministry of Brother Jackson. But that's only as far as he ever went with it. To know that, that times meant centuries and season meant decades which the Father put it in his own hands. So Jesus, it was not in his hands. But I thought Jesus had all power in heaven and earth and given them to me. Yes, because of that relationship with the one that knows everything, that has all power, that's omnipresent, omnipotent, and, all, and it knows, every, knows everything. He's the one that has that time frame for him. And when the time is right, he will speak to his son, even though he's up in glory now, in the same way that he spoke to his son when he walked on earth. Because the son says, I do nothing except what the Father shows me. It's not because of my intelligence of knowing things future. It's because the Father knows it, and he's in me. Now, some may jump to the conclusion, oh, well, the two spirits are together, so it makes Jesus just as intelligent as your heavenly Father. Forget it. That's an error. Jesus only knows what the Father reveals. And it is the Father, the Holy, which is part of the Holy Spirit, of His Spirit, that reveals things to you and I as well. All right. So now we have come to the place. It's not for them, He says, it's not for them to know the time and the seasons. But because He said that, preachers will jump on the bandwagon. Well, nobody's going to know. He said it for a reason for them not to know. But if you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, he says, you better know the time and the season because you're going to be caught unaware. That's why in the parable in, in Luke talks about those that there had their house broken, they were not watching concerning his... It's about his coming, not about how to be made ready. That's important too. But they weren't watching the revelation of being ready to when, oh, how close we are getting to the Lord. And just de if the Branham movement is just depending on, well, there's going to be a seventh seal open and we'll know then, there's a lot of gaps in between. And the same thing through the Jackson movement. It's all if you know that there's going to be a miracle war, building a temple and the Ezekiel war, then there's a lot of things in between that you do not know, that you do not accept, that you don't care about, because you never hear anything about it through their ministries. But still, it is in the Scripture. Now, as we would go... Now, looking at it from another point of view... When Jesus walked on earth and he says, All power in heaven and earth is given unto me, it only had to do with his ministry of being a high priest. And that power is not because, well, I've got it now and I can use it with it however I want. He was still in the same relationship as when he walked on earth as he is as high priest. He does nothing except what the Father wants him to do. So the power that Jesus had in those days, what was it for? He put on display, did he not, the nine spiritual gifts? Did he not display the attributes and the characteristics of our Heavenly Father? Yes, he did. And when he died on the cross, he died for every one of us because we can't go to heaven except there's a blood sacrifice. And being on the high priest sitting on that throne. He doesn't hear everybody's prayer. And like your testimony this morning. When you pray, it's Jesus that gives this instruction. He says, when you pray, go into your closet. Seek your heavenly father. Don't ask me because I won't know. But he that sees all things can answer your prayer when he deems to answer the prayer. 
And if it's something that affects the church, he will contact me and I will move in that way concerning the church. And how does he do does that? He has all the angels at his disposal to change things if it's necessary. That brings me to another point of view. Because Jesus doesn't know and sees and hears every little thing that every believer does because he's there like the high priest of the Old Testament. Picture yourself now the rapture or around the time of the, the seventh seal or the half hour silence uh, period of time or the seventh seal uh, time factor. There's going to be the judgment seat of Christ. We have to come before him, right? And the Father says, all the judgment is given to him. Now that judgment doesn't mean, oh, I know everything and I know exactly what to do. No, he's the one that's going to be speaking through the, the Father. Now, Jesus, we know he's not omnipresent. So how would he know from every saint that's in the grace age exactly what you've done and what reward you in order to give you your reward? Because remember, we come up individually before him, not as a group. Because there's many scriptures that talks about you, we, that we must all come before him individually that we are going to be judged on our reward, not our salvation. But the Father that's seen everything, that knows every part of your life, he even knew that before the foundation of the world. Then when we stand before him, the Father that's in him will say, this saint has done this, and he's done this good thing, and upon those things he will receive that reward. So Jesus says, he speaks so that to that believer. All right. But I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Now, when we come to, that's in 33 AD, that Jesus said he had all power in heaven and earth. That's when he walked here on earth. He would have that power till the time the seventh seal would be broken. But now that the seventh seal was broken, you are now in Revelation chapter 5. And verse 9 is where he actually breaks all the seals. Or the seventh is broke. Because it talks about all the seals being open. And we know the seventh one was not open in 63. It's up the road somewhere. It's not too far. And then everyone in heaven in verse 11 says, Blessing and honor and glory, power unto him that sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now, we looked at, in some sermons gone by, how that he was given wisdom. It is not the same wisdom that he received in 33 A.D. In 33 A.D. is the wisdom of those nine spiritual gifts. But the wisdom he receives now, when that seventh seal is broken, Revelation 5 and 12, is now the wisdom like Solomon had in order to rule. And Thursday night we got into the subject a little bit and we talked about power. He's given power. That the, the power that he's given is the power of government. He's going to have the scepter of David. That's the power. In that word power, it includes Jesus having a scepter. And what is a scepter? It's a symbol of supreme authority to rule. So when you start looking at all the scripture, bring in the sin, he's going to have that scepter that David had, which is a, is a symbol like, but that scepter means power and authority. And you find, if you don't know what scepter is, if you have access to the computer, you can go look at, in history's gone by, how that king's, or queens. How that when they ruled, they had a scepter with them as a symbol. That meant, I have the power. That king would have that power to rule. And whatever his rod. And then, then he could take that scepter. And he could give it to a general to go on the battlefield. And that general would now have the authority of the king to go do it. 
Now in Canada, we had a scepter. The Governor General, when we were still linked with Britain, the Governor General had a scepter. People say, oh yeah, he's just a, a stick. It's just, it just, well, it's, it's more than a symbol. It's, it actually is pointing to the authority that, that the Governor General had in Canada. But it went back in the days of Trudeau. We have separated from that, and now it's just a token as a representation. But now, as we look into Revelation 5 and 12, hear that the Lord now is given all this authority and power. It's for that millennium rule. You and I are in, well, I've got 2017. I can't keep updating the charts all the time. There's too many charts and too many things to update. But as time goes on, God does move things along. So in 2017, we came into the knowledge about Acts 1 and 7, that we do know the time and the season up to a point. And the revelation is so simple that when Israel became a nation in one day, right there, in 1948, because of the words of Jesus, that generation will not pass away. That means there will be no more, no centuries, till all things be fulfilled concerning his coming. So when that ended, since there would be no more centuries, then there would become decades. And that generation, as far as the human generation, to be, to be made ready and watching for the Lord's coming, it's not the preachers that were on ground in 1948. They're all but gone or in senior homes or in wheelchairs. But Jesus told two statements in that one in Matthew 24, 32. So when you see the fig tree puts forth the branch and starts to put forth leaves because of the hour we're living in, we know he's pointing to when the leaves would become and the leaves coming on ground to grow. That means there has to be more territory for Jews, which leaves means people, for Jews to come in to the land. And you just can't pick a date here and a pay, pick a date there. It is a scriptural date. Matthew, uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 24, that Jerusalem will no longer be occupied by the Gentile nation. That's your six-day war. That generation, as far as having a ministry that will be here when the rapture is going to take place, started in 1967. Now, if that is off, like some would say, well, nobody knows or whatnot, then I'd have to say the generation of preachers now is all going to be gone, too. There'll be another set. But the thing that's pointing, then you would be gone beyond a generation anyway to begin with. And centuries wouldn't mean anything. But it is from 1967. To me, it's so, so secure. It's so simple. And so we've gone five decades to 2017. And if a generation, according, we're talking about a generation, not one that's born somewhere that would live till the last one in, uh, that was born in that era of time will be 102 or whatever it is. He's talking about a generation that the Bible speaks about, that it would be 70 or maybe 80 years. Right? So the maximum it could go from 2017 is another 20 years. Or it could be 10. Now I don't want to get into all those scriptures again about other things over there. But now when we get into the place, because we know that centuries has ended. So Acts 1 and 7, we know part A. We, I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt concerning the scripture centuries that ended in 1948. When will the decades end? 
Well, we, he's given us some clues, more understanding how long these decades are going to be going on. And that information is found in Luke chapter 12 and in Luke chapter 19, that there would be three watches of the Lord's coming, knowing time-wise when he's going to come. Because those times and seasons, remember Jesus says you, it's important for you to know the time and the seasons, and especially in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, so that you're not caught unaware. And if he said there's some, if he said not, not to be caught unaware, read between the lines. There are some that's going to be caught unaware because they're not following the revelation. They're, in order to follow the revelation of God, hindsight is twenty twenty. The love of God, or your first love. Is that inspiration that comes that show you something fresh. Whether you, when you first came to the Lord, it had to come by revelation. Not because, well, I heard a prophet or I heard an apostle and, and I can see it in my mind and so therefore it applies to me. No, it don't. It's because of the Spirit. And when we move away from that Spirit showing what the truth is, and now depending on our education and our knowledge that we know things about Brother Branham and Brother Jackson, you have left your first love. Because you've lost the means to watch further. Because what brought you to that place is the same that is leading on to lead on to know what those three watches are about. All right. And we are now in that third watch. Yes, Luke, chapter 12, verse 38, talks about two watches. If I come in the second one, or a third watch. Now, this was not any ordinary prophet. This was Jesus himself saying this. And if he said there's a second and a third, read between the lines. There's going to be a second and a third. Well, what's the first one? Well, it's found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 13. He's told there, he's told in that parable, watch. Pray and watch. All right. So now as we've come to the hour that we are to watch, as we get closer in time... There's going to be scriptures brought forth that we, that as the Spirit of God, as time would come on ground, as things that would exist, now God can take those seasons or those decades and open up a little bit more information, a little closer to the day of that time that seventh seal is going to be broke. All right. Now that seventh seal time factor, it's a lot of things that's going to take place in there. God has brought a lot of things in the hour that we live in. Here, and since some do like quoting Brother Jackson, here I'll quote one. It was in the sermons he preached at the time in the seasons. And that was in August 1996, it's that, it's that contender there. When Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times, he is actually talking about centuries and decades. That's who God gave the revelation, what times meant and what, what season meant, which means centuries and decades. He goes on saying, and then Paul talks about in Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2, he's talking about centuries and decades. For not for you to know the time of season unless you be caught unaware. So if it's, a, if it's time and season is unimportant, then Paul the Apostle wouldn't have told Thess uh, Thessalon in Thessalonians, well, don't worry about it. Don't worry about him coming as a thief. Yes, it is important. So it, coming as, to know that the Lord's coming as a thief, you have to know times and seasons. If you don't, you will be caught unaware. 
But you have no need that I relate to you of the time of the season, or such like. That's what Brother Jackson thinks. And I will bring, I'll bring out in this light. Now, here's what he wanted to say. We would be blind if we failed to look at God's yardstick. Time and the seasons are as God's yardstick. So those that the Lord would catch unaware is because they're not looking or looking towards the Lord what he would have concerning that yardstick or the time and the seasons. And there would have to come a time where God has to bring things on ground. We can't come to the, the opening of the seventh seal. Oh, what was all that about, Lord? Is there, uh, can you fill us in now? No. People's going to know because it's important to show you how close you're getting to. All right. Now, as we move, like this, we can get into that subject. There's too many subjects to cover, to bring in, uh, to speak on everything. So in Matthew 28 and 19, Jesus receives the power for the grace age. And it's in that seventh sealed time factor that Jesus now receives. He says, he, he talks about, he is to receive. How many of you knows what, I may not be good in grammar and English, and some of you know that. But if it's talking to receive something, that means you don't have it in hand. It's given to you as a command if you want to. So in Revelation 5 and 12, he is to receive things concerning his millennium rule. So when we come to that millennium rule, yes, there's going to be after the seventh seal is broke, there's going to be activities going to take place in that seventh seal time factor, which most of the Jackson people don't see and understand. There's going to be a wedding supper, and that wedding supper, was it for? What are you going to feast on? More revelation? It's going to be instructions to where your position and where are you going to work through the millennium. We ain't going to come when we come with the Lord Jesus Christ and he sits on his throne. And let's say there's 10 million brides trying to get at Jesus where's my place that I'm going to rule from how am I you know what are the details we'll know that before we come down and that's at the wedding supper and so knowing that we are going to have our place that where we're going to rule in the earth at that particular time. You and I are not going to be in Jerusalem. And when we take the parable of Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 and 32, where it talks about how Jesus comes and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. I often wonder how in the world that's going to work. Because the Bible tells me through the day of the Lord there's a remnant saved. Well, if you take just 0.1% of 7 billion, that leaves you 75 million people. You ain't going to crowd no 75 million people here for him to judge that. It would take, it would take a good 50, 100 years to do that. So, remember, it's a parable. A parable is something that gives you an overall kind of a picture. Yes, it is Jesus going to be dividing the sheep from the goat, but not himself personally. It's his government. And the bride is his government. 
And when Jesus said to his disciples, to the 12 disciples, you will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Not at the white throne. Right from day one when he sits in his throne and he overall watches these 12 apostles, how they're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. And you and I are going to judge the, the remnant of wherever they are on the planet of the earth at the same time in our position because we really know where to go. Because if you put a 10 million bride trying to get here to find out where you're going to be, that's going to be chaos, wouldn't it? But now, knowing that we are given, that we're going to judge the world at the scripture, I believe it's in Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 or 1, somewhere in that area. After, I'm not so much remembering. But it's in, it's in Corinthians. Chapter 6. At least I know that. And you, you can search it in your own Bibles. But when he comes... Oh yeah, there it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world be judged by you... Now, sometimes our mind can get running just on an intellectual point of view, not having a revelation. Oh, that's at the white throne judgment. You're not judged there. You're there as a witness. The judge there is Jesus, sitting on that white throne. You and I and the bride is going to be judging the minute we come with the Lord Jesus Christ and we sit on our throne we will be dividing the sheep for the goats on behalf of Jesus Christ, which is the head of the government. So that parable in Matthew 25, verse 31, 32, yes, Jesus is separating the sheep from the goat. It's putting into a small sentence, but it doesn't give you every explanation of how it's going to be accomplished. Because if Jesus is going to divide every sheep from the goat, if I can add live, when he gets to sit down in his throne, and there's that big crowd, and he tells Peter and them, hey, no, I know I told you you were going to judge the, the 12 tribe, but forget it, I'm going to do everything. How silly that can be. And if there be about 75 million people that's left after the day of the Lord, wow. It would go some 50 years, or I, I'm just guessing 50 years or plus before you could even judge anything. And so how do we when Jesus comes and puts his foot on the Mount of Olives and going to be sitting in his throne how do we get to our throne? There again it's so simple. I don't have that picture here or not but Uh, let's see here. Day of the Lord. Yeah, here. That'd be all right. So we sometimes picture in our mind, we're all coming with him like the armies of heaven with the angelic beings and destroying the sinners from the face of the planet. That's not killing every, every human vessel. But it would be the sinners from, and there's going to be remnant from every nation left. And it says, every eye shall see him. It's okay if you're in the Middle East, you might be able to see this. How do you reconcile that every eye in the planet of the remnant is going to see this? Or even the armies that they're going to want to fight against him? It's because when he comes, the planet turns. And in 24 hours, every eye shall see him as he's coming. And when the time comes for him to actually step on the earth and to sit in his, his temple, 
you and I, it's not going to be out there and then just just crowding Israel. We are going to fan out. We are going to wait till the earth turns, and we're going to drop down to our place where we're going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. How many can see that? Because remember, it's His government. So as the earth turns, you and I are going to drop into the countries and the place. And we will know because we were at that wedding supper where we are going to fit in. And this uh, can all be established in 24 hours. You can sit on your throne within 24 hours. No jet plane needed. No boat. No cars. Because if Jesus can hold still here as, as we're coming with him and every eye sees him as the earth turns, then as the earth turns, it only takes 24 hours, he comes down in Jerusalem. But you and I are going to come down in our places of abode that we are going to be with him. It's his government that he sets up. That's what Matthew 25, verse, verse 31, 2 is implying. Is it... I mean, we can, we can uh, look at imaginary fairy tales and, oh, God's going to wish this and bingo. So, uh, mystically, somehow it's going to happen and nobody knows anything. And, and we'll know it while God's word says it's going to happen. We, we don't know how it's going to happen. Something has to be realistic. Yes, God can make poof and make even the planet disappear. But that's not his word. You and I are going to come down... As he steps into Jerusalem, as the world turns, you'll be in Canada, U.S., China, wherever, wherever the God, he wants us to rule. And we sit in there. And when it comes to judging, that place where he's going to sit on his throne, do you know how big that is? That's a mile wide, a mile square. No, it's only 20 cubits, 30 feet by 30 feet. So how many people can you crowd in 30 feet by 30 feet to judge 75 million people? Give your head a shake, you educated ones. Well, I don't know about you, but... And the Father knows where we're going to rule and reign even before the foundation of the world. And as Jesus is given authority, now when, when the Lord does come, everything that you see in heaven, it's not going to be staying up there. He's coming with all the angelic family. He's coming with his bride. All those white rolls will come, but at the time when he now brings in to the judgment for the sheep and the goat, they will come before and now have the resurrected body as witnesses. And when it comes to Jesus ruling and reigning in that millennium, he's going to rule with the scepter of David. The rod, he's going to Minister the rod of correction, right? What is the rod of correction? It means he has the authority. He has the authority, but the father knows and tells him, hey, that millennium subject that's over there, he's done this and that. You know, he's 4,000 miles away from you, but Jesus is not going to be everywhere to find out what everybody's doing in order to correct the rod. The father tells him, and the same one that tells the father will tell the administrator of the bride in that area, apply the rod, head office that said to apply the rod. I'll put it that way. So you and I are going to judge the world in the millennium. And the judging the world is, doesn't start after Jesus separated the sheep and the goat. We are in that government for that process. <laughs> 
Because if we had to wait till Jesus judged, I'm just so an arbitrary figure. Now, someone will say, well, well we know it's not 75 million, so we know you're, you're false. Go turn to another channel somewhere. Well, let's say there is 75 million. And it would take to do that, because of that little room that he's at, would take some 50 years or plus around. Now, that would contravene a couple of scriptures. One of them, it talks about we are going to rule and reign with Christ for uh, 950 years. Because we have to wait till Jesus does everything. No, we reign, rule and reign for a thousand, the same length of time that he reigns for one thousand years. It's so simple when God opens it up. Praise the Lord. Well, now I'll put the world away and I'll put your thrones away. If you wanted the scriptures concerning the 12 tribe, he talks about in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, they'll sit on 12, they'll sit on throne judging the 12 tribe of Israel. And for you and I, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Now it talks about in Jeremiah 25, uh, 23 and verse 5, unto David, the righteous branch, a king shall reign. Who's that king? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going he's to reign, not himself doing everything. He's going to have a government. David had a government. And when someone needed to be dealt with in the far part of the, of the, of the country, then the representative would speak on, on David's behalf. It's the same thing as our government. If someone's caught doing something illegal and he's caught by the police, he's brought before the court. Well, Prime Minister Trudeau doesn't go to that court to do the judgment. There's power being delegated in his government to do that. Or whether it's Trump. Now, there you can, well, don't go there. Because there could be a lot of fake news. Now, but all I'm trying to stress is if, it's not if, it is his government that he sets up in Matthew 25, verse 31 and 32. I can't stress that enough. Because otherwise, if it's Jesus doing everything, then there's a pile of scriptures that you'll never know that can never be fulfilled. They'll always be up there in the air. But when we got the picture right, then all these scriptures dovetail, and it makes, if you want to, spiritual sense and even natural sense that they can be accomplished. Well, are you still happy? I know I went through a, a whole lot of things in very short blurbs. But there's sermons that we did preach already on those things. So it is important to know the time of the seasons. We know of a surety that this times has ended in 1948. We know some season has gone on. Well, then when we're looking at the watches and other things like that, that gives you more information about the seasons. I could have went in into something concerning about Ezekiel 38 and 39, how that it would be seven years burning the weapon. And if you put that in the right place and how it ends, then when you look at it backwards, it gives you now a more pinpointed time what the season is going to be. Ah, oh, but you're, it's just your idea. Stick around. A lot of churches will be fulfill what Jesus said. If the man of the house knew when the thief would come. What did the thief do? He stole that first love of the revelation they should have been looking into that they don't have. And when the time comes, 
that the, that that seal is broke, they're found without. That don't mean they don't have no re, no understanding and no revelation at all. And then there's always saying, well, they have a revelation every day. And they say they have a revelation, but they never put one up. Never say what it is. Why is that? And we don't have a revelation every day. It's been 13 years plus. God has added little things here as time went on. And it makes the picture so clear. As I looked again on, not that we're looking, you don't look for a number. God takes care of the numbers. But there's as many that hooks on on the west coast of the United States, California, those, those states there, than there is all on the east coast. That's telling me that if things don't straighten up, God will raise another group like he did with Brother Jackson. Oh, but we, we got so, we got these preachers and that preachers. When you t- start talking, that okay, well, look at the preachers we got, and you, now they look at uh, where Brother Jackson's church is. They, they could crow it for a while. They had so many preachers, but now they hardly have a quorum to make the five. When you go down that road to looking at numbers, you're falling into the same trap David did. Number the people to, sh- to show the strength you have, which God hates. We best walk with the Lord humbly, quietly. And one of these days, I will be, hopefully as the Lord would leave, preach you a nice salvational message. But that's why there's a fivefold ministry. But then again, when you're listening, listen with the Spirit, with the Holy Ghost ear of what you're hearing. It's not because, well, so and so, I got so-and-so and he said this, and then, well, that all makes sense, and uh-uh. Well, that's why he's given you and I that comforter, that Holy Spirit. It's the comforter that confirms in your or my life what is truth and what is not. And the comforter's not worried about numbers and who's, who's who and who's what. And we're getting on overtime. But praise the Lord. Let's just stand at this time. Lord, as we look towards thee, Lord, we ever so thankful, Lord, that you have, Lord, moved us on, Lord. And I just pray as we would walk on with thee, Lord, that we be humbly, Lord, looking to what you would have for us in the days to come. Now I pray, Lord, use the words that were spoken as you would see fit. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, in that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be seated. So still, if someone that still has a need of prayer, we'll, we'll pray. Uh, we'll sing a hymn.
Life is easy when you're up on the mountain. You have peace of mind like you've never known. But then things change when you're down in the valley. Don't lose faith, for you're never The God of the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, He'll make them right. The God of the good times is still God in the bad times. God of the day, He's still God of the night. You talk of faith when you're up on the mountain. Over when life's at its best. When you're down in the valley of trials and temptation, that's when faith is really put to the test. For the God of the mountain, He's still God of the valley. When things go wrong, He'll make them right. The God of the good times, He's still God in the bad times. The God of the day, the God of The God of the mountain, He's still God of the valley. When things go wrong, He'll make them right. For the God of the good times, He's still God in the bad times. God of the day is still God of the night. Amen. Thank you, Father. Well, praise the Lord, and let you stand. And I think the weather be well enough for our service this evening, so for those that can, we'll be here. Praise the Lord. Brother Ray, would you come and dismiss us in a word of prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this wonderful time, your wonderful mercy to us. Heavenly Father, especially today, we pray that you would give us traveling mercies. Father, just lead us on day by day. Dismiss your children now with your blessing. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.